What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-host, Julie Mitchell. How you doing, Julie? Good morning. I'm doing great. Good to see you again. Awesome. Awesome. You had, you had a good Veterans Day? I did. Did you? Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you, Chili's. Thank you, <laughs> Chili's, for my, my, my meal. I appreciate that. No endorsement uh, implied. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and I got a special call today. Uh, we got uh, my sister in arms out there in uh, Europe. Uh, she's the senior advisor for the exchange in Europe. Sorry, Major Julia Henry. How you doing, Sorry, Major? I'm good. Doing real well there, Chief. Feeling warm and fuzzy. The sun was out earlier. You know, it decided to break the sky and, and shine through all the clouds that was out there. I'm looking up because I'm, I'm, I'm currently working from home. So I was looking to see, but hey, it's five o'clock and the sun is going down here, man. Absolutely. How was your Veterans Day? Veterans Day was good. I worked all day. I was on Ramstein handing out coins, uh, you know, the, our veterans coins. And it was greatly appreciated by our veterans and their families uh, took a lot of pictures. So it was a good thing. Awesome, awesome. So I'm super excited about our guest today. Um, uh, because we get the opportunity to sit down with a real life American hero. And uh, although he wasn't born in this country, he embodies patriotism and I'm proud to be his brother in arms. Uh, without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Chief, you're exactly right. This is a very special episode of Chief Chat. It's part of our In Recognition of series. In honor of Veterans Day, we are saluting our nation's heroes like today's guests, our friends at the Navy Exchange, the Marine Corps Exchange, the Coast Guard Exchange, and the Defense Commissary Agency will be helping us host these episodes of the special series throughout November. Today's guest earned the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest award for valor for his actions in Afghanistan on August 8th, 2012, while he was serving in the army. He is a true hero. It is our distinct privilege to have him with us as our guest today. Please help us welcome Captain Florent Groberg. Yay. Thank you, Joey, Chief and Sergeant Major. Super fired up to be a part of this uh, this show today. Looking forward to the questions and sharing some of my thoughts and hearing some of yours as well. Thank you so much, sir. And for all of those who are watching, now is a good time to drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. You can leave questions and comments for Captain Groberg, and we will try to get to them during the live feed. Also, start a watch party and enjoy this live broadcast with your friends. If you're not already following our page, you should. We have terrific guests coming to you throughout the rest of 2020. Awesome. Awesome. So Captain Groger, Groberg, man, I'm truly, truly, uh, it's an honor to have you with us today. Uh, I want to, on behalf of all the military exchanges and the commissary, we just want to appreciate you for your service and dedication to this great nation. And uh, thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Of course, I'm, I'm honored and humbled that uh, I'm even a guest. I mean, we were just chatting. Uh, you, you got me, but really, I'd rather listen to The Rock, personally. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. I appreciate y'all. <laughs> appreciate the invite. Listen, you're on the same level as The Rock, sir, so don't don't worry about it. <laughs> I would say he's higher than The Rock. I met The Rock when he was in college. I was in high school. You know, uh, a good story there. But, sir, we appreciate uh, you taking the time out. And I echo Chief uh, Osby's sentiment of, you know, of gratitude of you joining us today. And I was reading your bio and I was like, huh, we got a few things in common. Migrated to the United States at 12 years old, me. Really? Um, as well as I got my citizenship citizenship in 2001. Okay. Like, huh. Yeah, so, you know, I just want to tell you thanks for all that you've done and, and, and what you continue to do, um, you know. So where are you joining us from today and how are you uh, dealing with the pandemic, sir? I am actually joining you from this is my I'm in my office upstairs my house and just outside of Seattle Washington and uh, you know it's been the pandemic is just like everyone else we all we've all been uh, challenged uh, our life you know has completely changed and in this case I I have not worked in an office uh, since February I believe yeah March February uh, it's been uh, very different for me because one of the key things that I love is traveling and, you know, meeting with, with people, I mean, face to face and, you know, conducting my business in, in that sense. And so, you know, going through this new world of virtual where everything is done through virtual has been 
challenging at times, but it's also what we, what I learned in the military is that you got to be adaptable. You have to, you know, be able to evolve uh, and overcome. And so I've taken, there's been some positives, a lot of positives too. It's that you, you can actually, you know, meet with more people uh, at a rapid rate um, that you can, we, we're doing more work than we ever expected. There's no more that excuse. I'm on an airplane. Can't, can't get to this. Thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Dang, but, I can't use that no more, man. You know, but it's been, it's been, it's been interesting to you know, deal with customers and, and really close deals down. Um, but uh I'll, I'll say this and everything that I've done in my life, I try to find a positive in a negative situation. Uh, this has been a very you know, difficult time for all of us, uh, for our nation, uh, our country, our world, our partners, it's globally. But I, it's also giving me an opportunity to spend a lot of time with my wife. Um, I, you know, I was usually on the road every week, uh, a lot of weekends gone for different events or different commitments or traveling overseas. Uh, and this is the longest I spent in a row with my wife, which validates my our marriage because I love her, uh, uh, you know, more today than I did yesterday. And I can't look forward to loving her more tomorrow. Uh, and it really has solidified the fact that she's my best friend in the world. And we made the best decision together to, you know, uh, commit to each other for life. That's really sweet. That's oh, sweet. And you had, you had shared that your anniversary is coming up too. So that's the congratulations on, you believe you said two years together. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I'm super fired up. I got her her gift. It's right here next to Ooh, my left. You can we see? Can we see? Do we get us? No, we probably, probably can't see, <laughs> right? It's probably up. ruin it for her. It's, it's wrapped, wrapped up. Yeah, it's oh, just, it's, it's, is uh, it a big box or a small box? I like small boxes. Yeah, it wouldn't be a surprise anymore, Julie. If it, well, I know, I really want to know. know. I just, I love this. It's right here. I can't push through this because she'll know what it's from, but it's- Okay, I got you. Ooh. It's in here. Oh, what's this? This is cool. It's an yeah. unboxing. This is so exciting. So it's in here. I can't wait. She'll get that, she'll get down Saturday. She's watching this for some odd reason. Uh, she'll know what it is. Oh, that's <laughs> Well, that's, hey, sir, that's my wishful thinking that, that this is like the, the main street. This uh, show is on mainstream right now. So that's me. I'm in trouble. If she, if she catches wind, let us know. Then we'll know we've really. I will. We've made it. We know we've made it if she, if she saw it beforehand. Sir, we would like to kind of start off talking about, about what led you to join the Army. I know you're from France, and as Sergeant Major Henry said, you came to the United States at age 12. So what led you to decide to serve? Well, it's uh, first of all, Sergeant Major, that's, uh, it's, I'm fired up to hear about your story as well. You, like you said, things in common. I mean, these are two pretty big things that you have in common. Uh, and I think a lot of what I'm talking about uh, it's going to be different, but also similar to you. And you, you might, you know, you'll be able to relate. But see, my, the reason why I joined the Army, it's because, you know, since at an early age, I moved to the U.S. And right away, something happened, traumatic happened in my family. Uh, so I'm adopted. And, and half my family is, you know, Algerian, so North African. And the other half is, you know, from Gary, Indiana, in essence, right? And my dad. And so my funny joke is my dad's 6'2", blonde, green eyes, Swedish. So when I used to, you know, introduce him to people at school or when he'd pick me up from practice, people would be like, who's that? And that's my dad. He looked at me saying like, really? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Think, thinking, There's you know, a whole story think, there. <laughs> they're like, Mori Povich. They're, the first thing was like, Mori Povich. <laughs> <laughs> like all right so and, and honestly it was interesting because i never challenged anyone so i can only imagine the thoughts behind because i didn't i wasn't at a young age it was hard it was hard to you know explain to folks when you're that you're adopted um you know today it's easy to talk about it right but when you're 14 15 years old for some odd reason i was not as comfortable with it but when i was 12 when we moved here to the u.s and something traumatic happened and my uncle was killed by a, uh, a terrorist organization called the gia uh, they came into Algeria in the late 1980s, early 1990s, tried to take over the country, uh, bring radical Islam into it. And my uncle actually was a preacher of the Muslim faith. He was an imam. And when he saw this, these, this group of uh, you know, individuals that were perverting his religion, he took arms, took up arms. And he joined the army, special forces, actually was trained in the U.S. for a little bit with some of our special operators. And he fought against them for you know, six, seven years. And then on in, in 1996, he was uh, during a ceasefire to observe Ramadan. Uh, they were ambushed and he was wow. shot and he was killed. But the, the, the really the more tragic part about it is what they did with his body. Uh, they dismembered him and put him in a box and sent him to my grandfather. 
And I, say, I always tell this specific part because even though it's hard to hear and it's just, you know, so uh, terrible, uh, it's an important piece because it, it's all about terrorism. And what they wanted to do was send, they sent a box to my grandfather because my grandfather is pretty well known in Algeria. He was a prisoner of war in the French Indochine, uh, French Vietnam. Uh, and then he was one of the catalysts for the Algerian independence against France. Uh, and so, and he's a doctor and, you know, owns the town, got well, well respected. And so to kill his son in such a gruesome way and to send the body parts, that was a message, right? To like, we do not care about anyone here. If you don't follow us, this is what we're going to do this to everyone. And instead of, um, of bringing fear, it, it sort of created this, this, uh, this uh, response from the local populace and a lot of uh, other people who really took up arms and they kicked GIA out without anyone else, by the way, I'd like to put that out, right? No US, no France, no one else. They kicked them out by themselves. And so, you know, I, in my heart, I feel like his death wasn't, you know, for nothing. Uh, and, and, you know, there are many other outcomes and reasons why they kicked the GIA out, but, you know, I try to consolidate myself with, with the fact that, you know, he, he had this, you know, powerful, you became this powerful martyr in essence for, for that country. But that shocked my system and that brought an understanding of evil that I was, I think too young to truly really, I should have never been able to grasp. And I didn't understand terrorism, the word terrorism at that moment, I, but I didn't understand the word pain. And so you fast forward a few years later and here I am naturalized as a US citizen in 2001 and seven months later, the same type of individuals who, you know, terrorized my family in 1996 are now, have now attacked my adopted country. Yeah. And that was my, that was literally what cemented my mindset and my path towards the military. I knew that that's, I needed to be part of the solution. And so I wanted to, um, you know, join the military. And the fact that every male in my family has been in the military, whether it's in France in Algeria or, or in the United States, uh, it's, it, it was an easy decision for me, but I needed the, I needed to find a way to earn the right to call myself an American. Oh, I, I totally understand that, sir. Um, yeah, that that that's, ooh, that's a lot. Yeah. And is. you know, it, it that kind of gives us a sense of purpose. Like, you know what? Let me go out here. I I need to do more because so much has been sacrificed for me. Let me go ahead and do more because I need to be big, do something bigger than myself. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's an inspiring story, sir. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely, sir, Major. Yeah, and, and, and your family um, is, is, is super proud of you. And, and I'm sure your uncle is, is looking down like, man, it, you know, my nephew, he, he's, he's the real deal. So man, uh, yeah. thank you for sharing that story, absolutely. So let, let, let's kind of shift gears and talk about uh, August, the 8th, 2012. Um, and and I, I got a chance to do some research on you uh, here in the past couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, you were leading a security detail for a high ranking official in Afghanistan. And you headed to a weekly meeting. This is pretty much your normal battle rhythm while you were there. Um, but you noticed something out of the ordinary uh, and you end up tackling a suicide bomber. That's, I mean, I get chills even just read, just, 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 just saying that. So. Can you tell us uh, about that day? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's super interesting because I didn't talk about August 8th almost ever prior to the medal. Um, and I think that's um, it's very similar to a lot of my peers or, in the, you know, and, and service members who have gone through some, you know, really difficult times in, in, in deployments or outside of deployments. And, but that day was was you know, the, the worst day of my life, right? And I mean, it's, it's hands down without a doubt. Um, we were going to that security meeting, as you mentioned, we had done this, we had been on this patrol multiple times. My first tour in Afghanistan in 2010, I actually owned up a part of that area of operation. So this meeting happened every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, for years. Yeah. And we knew that IWC, that that was a problem, right? Because it's the same meeting. So at the same time, so the enemy could plan any attack, right? So we didn't want to create a pattern in terms of, uh, of the bringing the boss to, to you know, sit into that meeting. So we'd go maybe two weeks in a row and not go for four, right? Things like that. But he had to go. It's, you know, Kunar is too important in Eastern Afghanistan. Uh, and we needed to build those relationships with the governor and some of his local officials, as well as some of his, the military leaders in that, in that area of operation. So on that day, we brought two brigade commanders, 
two battalion commanders, an Afghan general, two GS-15 State Department individuals, two Bragers, uh, and my unit of six individuals. I'll be honest with you, uh, there was a failure in there. Uh, the failure was that I requested 15 to 20 escort when we arrived at the combat outpost uh, FIAS to, to escort us to the meeting because it was from the military base where we landed our, our, our aircraft to the actual meeting. It was an 1100 meter movement on foot. And every single time we stepped outside the wire, we always had a US element to escort us because my unit wasn't designed to fight the fight against an enemy attack. We were like secret service. This is what we used to call ourselves, kind of you know, as a joke. If something happens, we all we put we have a diamond where we put all the principles, so the high ranking officials in the diamond, and then we have a guy up front, right, left, rear. If something happens, someone shoots at us, IED, whatever it is, or any type of threat, all four of us sort of take the principle or the principles down on the ground, we cover them with our bodies, and then we escort them out of the danger zone. The other element around us, they fight the fight, they eliminate the threat. So there are opportunities to exfil. So when I landed, I didn't have that element. element, um, And I had made a request very clear in the, the night prior because I never had such a heavy group of senior leaders, military leaders and civilian leaders um, under my watch. And there was no one there. And so the, the, the individual prior said, hey, you know, the major that I talked to on the phone the night prior, um, I don't know what he was thinking, but he he uh, he told me we'll walk the route 15 minutes prior and clear it. So his idea was like, hey, let me clear the route before they get there, and and then so that they don't have to worry about it. The problem is he cleared it, but he didn't secure it. <laughs> so yeah. hello, right? So you can clear the route, but if you leave, it's no longer cleared. You know, yeah. it's one on one. And unfortunately, they left. They went to the compound. And so when we walked the route about 700 meters into it, this is when we were targeted by um, the bombers. And what they did, it was is they created a diversion, a standard, right? They came at us with motorcycles. So we we're all fixated towards motorcycles, right? Odd. Why is this motorcycle you know, coming so fast at us? Uh, in the meantime, an individual that was in a structure to our left walked out. Here's what I did, though, that day that... Um, I think, you know, I, I want to give props to the Afghan National Army folks that were with us, right? I'll be honest with you, I never have really trusted them. Um, but I fought with some, with some of them who are brilliant and they're warriors. And on that day, those guys, you know, were on point. So because I didn't have that U.S. element, I, need, I, 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 try, I, I went around that base trying to find anyone that was yeah. U.S. Army military that could come and support us. So, but I couldn't really find anyone. I found two people. And one of them was a cook. And he wasn't, he wasn't a U.S. Army cook. So I think I broke, I broke a couple of rules there. But I saw a bunch of Afghan National Army guys smoking cigarettes at the gate. So I sent my translator to ask them to join us. And, and I think there's about 10 of them. And I put them up front. I told them, you know, spread out. And what I wanted to accomplish in that moment, I wanted to appear big, right? So if, you know, if we are targeted for some odd reason, that at least they see that it's not just that heavy element and six people. It's like, you know, we just added 10 people. So maybe deter the enemy from, you know, um, going after us. It's, it didn't deter them, but what it did is it created us, it created a pocket for us because they were up there. When the motorcycles came, the point man, he was on his game, like immediately raised his rifle, started screaming in Dari, forced the bike to actually fall, the guys on the bike to fall. And then he chased them. <laughs> wow. Right. I don't know. I, I always wonder like what happened? There, like, because I know that guy. Some, someone, some people have said, "Oh, maybe he was in on it." I'm like, dude, he was not in on it. This guy was like pissed. Like he was chasing him. Like he went after him. But what that did is, I do believe that also saved a lot of us because it prevented the bike from getting closer. God knows what they had on that bike. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also gave me gave me time to identify the threat to my left. And when I saw the individual, I knew obviously he was a threat, couldn't see a weapon, so I couldn't engage him with my rifle. So I just, just kind of, I remember thinking like, well, I got to get, you know, I don't like him, so let me go figure out what's going on. So when he started coming towards us, I sprinted towards him. Um, and I hit him, my rifle, I felt something in his chest. In that moment, I realized, oh my goodness, this is not good. So I let go of my rifle that was uh, slung to my kit, and I grabbed him, and that's when I knew he had a vest. And the only thing I could think of was, I got to get him away from the boss as quickly as possible, as far away as possible. Uh, so I pushed him and threw him. And, you know, I saw Mahoney, my RTO followed me uh, into this. He's probably thinking like, oh, here goes Lieutenant. Go and do something crazy again. 
Yeah. Um, and he followed me right into it. And then as I threw him, he tried to like, you know, make sure that he landed on the ground uh, faster. And so the guy landed chest first and detonated. I, um, I hear a lot on um, people asking, you know, I get, I get this question a lot, which is what were you, you know, why did you react that way? What were you thinking? And I think this is the beauty of the military is that I went into the military with a lot of hate and anger. Right. Honestly, I did. I, you know, for the people that, that terrorized my family and, and, and my country and, and, and some of my friends I've lost overseas over the years. And I left with a with a sense of, an, of understanding of what love is and not love for the enemy, but love for for your brothers and sisters uh, that wear the uniform, that you're willing to die day in, day out, night in, night out for each other, literally willing to die. And so when I had to make a decision to go towards a danger, a threat. And specifically when I realized he was a suicide bomber, my body didn't react in shock. I didn't become, you know, I wasn't paralyzed by fear. Instead, I was driven by love. And by that, I was driven by the love of my brothers and sisters, by my team and my responsibility that I needed to protect them. And I didn't think about death. I thought about doing my job and whatever the outcome was at the end, that's the outcome. That's what I signed up for. That is that is the discipline in our, in our job. And it allowed me to be a professional. It allowed Mahoney to be a professional, Seco, Ochart, you know, Balderrama, everybody else on my team to be professionals. Um, but even when you're at your best, it's war. And on that day, we still lost Command Sergeant Major Griffin, Major Gray, Major Kennedy, and Reggae. So that was the worst day of my life. Yeah, and it's just it's just crazy how because um, I think about when I when I deployed and. and and that really changed my life specifically because you see stuff that you can't unsee or you, you're part of something that, that really affects you as a person. And um, I thought about, I was like, you know what? It, we're back in garrison and we may get into some drama over some real frivolous stuff or whatever the case may be, but just knowing that when the stuff hits the fan, like your brothers and sisters got your back. And yeah. so that's just, you know, you just, it's, it's just hard to even talk or, or, or explain that. I agree. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, you speak about the love and uh, that you have for your your brothers because that's what they become. You know, we, we eat, we sleep together, we we train together. So, in, in that, you know, you take that and you you hold that. It's it's etched in you. You know, and, and just to hear your story about you just, you know, grabbing that person there and just shoving them, I was like, wow, you got out there, you assessed the threat. Your OPSEC training really kicked in. The Army values, the warrior ethos, you know, I will never quit. I will never accept defeat. I will, I will place the mission first. It, it, it's like you just embody all of that. So, you know, just. Yeah, I'm it's grateful a- just to know you. Yeah. And also, when you know, talking about the ethos, because we talk about the Airman's Creed or the, or the Army Creed or, or the Warrior Ethos, and we, 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 we spot them out wherever, right, in garrison. But man, when you're actually in combat, in action, like those Warrior Ethos, you have to personify those. You have to be, you have to go out there and actually execute those ethos and those, those creeds that we, we spot out on a, on a regular basis. So the, the, the beauty behind it, though, is that you, you know, some people are like, wow, okay, that's amazing. Like, but that's, we all did. That's, that is how we operated every single day. You know what I mean? It's, it's instilled in you. It's training you. It's embedded in you, whatever you want to call it, right? And that's the beauty of the military. Uh, I went into the military, and I remember my first day when I went to basic training, right? They give you, you get a haircut, right? You get the same clothes. Uh, your bed looks like the, the his bed or her bed, right? It's everything's the same because they teach you right away that you need to take this whole thing, this thing called I, your, and how you being an individual and you put that to the side because now it's about the team, right? You need to learn that everything you're doing here is it's to benefit success in the mission, but you can only do it together, you know, by, uh, by collaborating together, by working together, by trusting each other and, and by being, you know, having the integrity when no one's watching that you're doing the right thing, right? And these are things that I learned in basic training, OCS, you know, officer leadership course, really learned that in Ranger School uh, about the whole integrity, <laughs> you yeah. know, no one's watching. Yeah. Um, and and then, you know, you, you all this translates to when you have to react in a specific way in a, in a very dangerous situation, you don't have to think, right? Because it's it's who you are. It's yeah. your instincts are set still. 
and you, you can drive on and operate. And that's what makes us very unique and, and special. You know, and you're right, sir. That stuff is so etched in me. I was doing something a few days ago and someone came to me and she said, um, Sergeant Major, you're off. Why are you out here directing traffic? Why are you picking up trash? Because it's just embedded in you, in us. You just can't walk by something and not correct it because then it festers and becomes something better. So all that stuff is just, it's just ingrained in us. Well, some major though, you're, 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 you're another breed though. I, I, you know, when you make, I think, I think there's a requirement. I don't know what this unspoken requirement is. Once you make SAR major, you see things faster, a lot further. <laughs> uh, you notice things. So, Commander Sergeant Major Griffin used to be, I, we can get all, we'd be landing our helicopter in Jalalabad and he'd be like, oh, what? That guy. You know, and then he'd be out of that helicopter, fascinating thing, running over there be like, why is your, why are your sleeves rolled up? Like, holy, how did you see that? <laughs> Fuck eyes. So I'm like, man, this guy is on point, right? He that always look, he, he, he look at my glasses. Like six cents. He look at my sunglasses and be like, these standards? I, where'd you get these? I'm like, I, how, like, I mean, dude, why did you see the logo, right? I blacked out the logo on purpose. I was trying to get one by him. He's like, nope. <laughs> Saw that. It's like, man, okay, I got it. <laughs> He's like, and his comment was simple. He's like, there are rules. Follow the rules. It's really simple. Like, if you don't follow the rules, I'm going to call you out on it. I'll fix you, sir. I was like, Roger, that's not major. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to love Sergeant major. Definitely. Absolutely. This is standard. Follow the standard. That was his point. It was actually really, he's like, life is really simple. Follow the standard. That's all, that's all I'm asking. That's like, it. Right. You follow the standard. You, you can't go wrong. You can't yeah. go wrong. <laughs> it's already <laughs> laid out for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really rulesy too, even though I'm not in the army. So I, I can, uh, I can appreciate that wanting to follow the rules. So, <laughs> so sir, you mentioned their names, uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, you know, 24 out of the 28 people on patrol that day survived. Um, then the, there were four who did not come home. How do you honor them and, and remember them and continue to, to think about them today? Well, I think in different ways, right? So one, bring up their names every time I have a conversation about me in my military service. It's, um, you know, their names are always brought up. So Commander Sergeant Griffin, Major Gray, Major Kennedy, and Reggie Abdel Fattah always, multiple times. I think that's one very important way to honor those who don't come home because it, they're, in my story, my life story, they're my heroes, right? With my uncle. And also the, all the friends that I've lost, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Novacek, Sergeant, Sergeant King, Sergeant, Sergeant Kennedy, you know, uh, uh, people, Cardenas, all those folks that, you know, were Finnegan, geez, you know, that were killed, uh, that you had relationship with, even though like Finnegan and, and, and Kennedy and Cardenas, I didn't have a close relationship with them, but they were iconic in, in you know, within our unit, in our group, like they meant so much to us. Um, Brown and Novacek were the two first casualties of that tour in 2012. There used to be, they used to be on my, in my, in my company when I was EXO uh, and when I was a platoon, uh, platoon leader, I was really close to both of them. Novacek and I had the same birthday. We're both Chicago guys, you know, big Blackhawks fan. I owed him $45 actually for uh, uh, tickets that we were going to a Blackhawks game that I had to miss because of pre-deployment things. Um, and then Brown and I, you know, to the, to still talk to his mom uh, on through Facebook. Actually, she might be watching this. You know, she, uh, she, he was one of the most fascinating and charismatic leaders, right? And so when you lose these folks, you, it, it changed your life. And so the only way to, to me to really honor them is by talking about them, sharing their story, other people hearing their names. Another way that I do it is I, you know, obviously I have my bracelet. We all have, I think, you know, in the military, we, a lot of us have a, a bracelet. And that's just a constant reminder that I am blessed because I was given a second chance. Um, a bomb detonated at my feet and I lived and four individuals that were 30 feet away died from that bomber and so i can't put that together i don't understand how, how that works i don't understand how, how i can still be here but i do know that i am here and so it's my duty and my responsibility to make sure that i earn it and so by that by do, in doing so i need to be a better person uh i need to go out there and do great things that i never thought i could accomplish uh i need to be a voice for my community a positive voice for my community and I need to honor them. And so that's that. And finally, it's, you know, I have a relationship with their families. Abdel Fattah, I don't. His family went back to Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been hard, you know, for them, for his wife and different world, right? And so 
Uh, but you know, the Griffins, the Grays, and the Kennedys, I try to do everything that I can to honor them and and their kids and, and their families. So I'm close to them. Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, you talked about you know you the the guy landed at your feet, um, and can you can you talk about your your injuries? I know you had sustained some significant injuries from that. Uh, what was, what was the injuries and what was the recovery like? I I'm, I'm bringing my phone up because it's kind of funny that uh, it's not funny honestly, um, but it, it's I, I'm leaving this here because it all lead into it. My um, I lost fifty percent of my calf. Um, I've had some you know I had thirty three surgeries, which is nothing compared to some of my friends that I spent a lot of time with at Walter Reed. What they've gone through. I know folks have gone over a hundred surgeries. Think about being put under the uh, you know under for over a hundred times. Yeah, that's crazy. And I had a traumatic brain injury, uh, pretty severe concussion. They called it mild. I want to know what the heck severe is, I guess. But, uh, you know, uh, I couldn't remember. I couldn't do math for six months. I was never the greatest at math. But, you know, I, I could tell you how many quarters were in a dollar. Yeah. I, I couldn't do that for six weeks. I couldn't, you know, I would look at pictures and I'd be able to, I knew what it was. It's a giraffe or it's a lion, but you just can't come up with the word, right? Uh, following the directions. They literally would be like, okay, uh, here are the directions. You go down the hall, you make a right at the, on the second on the second right right hallway make a right and then go down and on the third door make a left right and i'll get to the hallway and i'll be like what'd she say you know that's freaky when when your brain is not operating the way you expect it to operate that is freaky and um and so i spent a lot of time in the hospital five months four months inpatient uh which was really frustrating you know four hour vitals every four hour vitals you never sleep um and I was going through some really tough times emotionally as well and mentally uh, from, you know, the, the, the incident. Uh, and then infections really played a, mat, a key uh, you know, role in, in my life. And today, as we speak, this morning, I was literally texting with my wound care specialist, that, uh, Carrie Gouch, that was, um, uh, took care of me at Walter Reed. And she's no longer there. She's now a GW because I've been having issues with my foot again. Uh, you know, it opened up. It just won't drain. And so I wanted to bring up this message because she's telling me like, oh, she's going to text me later today. Uh, and, and she's already sent me to Madigan Hospital here at, at Lewis. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I'm very picky about my care. So I kind of, I'm like, I need to go back to Dempsey or I need to go back to Walter Reed to get this taken care of because I, I just don't trust people. Because um, I've had too many surgeries and too many, too many infections. But this yeah. is my best friend. This is, y'all you, you, you will appreciate this because this is how military thinks. I wrote my F foot won't heal. And he was too. Well, I'm surprised it lasted this long. The government can give you a new one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's a joke that we have. He's <laughs> just like, because everybody's quick to, to amputation. And my wife is, she's like, well, you know, if you do get amputated, it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be there to support you. But can I go out there and like watch it? I'm like, what the heck is wrong with you two? <laughs> my two best friends in the world. My best friend out there, my wife are like, you know, joking around this thing, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. I do, I do believe that eventually I will, my, you know, I'm limb salvage. I do believe eventually my leg will be amputated uh, because I think, you know, I'm looking at it now. It just keeps getting, it doesn't heal. Um, and when you think it's healing, you know, little things pop up and then it just affects the way I operate. And so just the fact that in my back of my head right now, you know, today I woke up and I see that it's still not draining you know, and th there's an opening. I'm thinking like, well, I need to get another surgery. They need to wash it out. They need to drain it. I need to go back on some stitches, maybe put another wound back on it. And all I'm thinking about is how, how long am I going to be, you know, am I, am I, am I not going to be able to work out for it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so, but it's okay. Right. It's okay because I'm here. Um, I know I have, have, have a lot of friends who are going through it much worse. Uh, if it is amputation down the road, it's amputation. I know we have the best doctors in the world here uh, and they have a hell of a lot of experience, unfortunately with it. And the condition of life probably would be better than what I have now. Uh, but it's just the idea of missing a foot. It's just like, it's not my cup of tea right now, but, but that's, that's, you know, eight years later, it's still a topic of conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're, we're praying yes, for sir. you. Sir. We're praying for you on this side. So I uh, hope everything yes, works. Sir. I, I concur. But sir, I heard you are a, a big CrossFit fan. So you've been getting your CrossFit on. I heard. Yeah. Well, yesterday I did a workout with uh, my buddy, Eric uh, Bartel, um, you know, and you're my, I, I love, I love, um, I, I'm so put it this way. I'm not a, a, 
I, I can't do a lot of the CrossFit, you know, exercises on some of those guys because my leg, I can't, I can't mm-hmm. deadlift. I, mean, I can't really like squat as much as I can, but I love it. Right. I do a lot of hit workout, a lot of CrossFit workouts. Uh, I do probably four or five CrossFit workouts a, a week. Uh, we work out six days a week in my house. My wife's seven. She's just a badass. Um, and then, you know, we have the Peloton different things. So yesterday we did a, a veterans day workout all night on an Instagram live and it was pretty cool. Right. Because you do, we did 11 rounds of, of pull-ups, push-ups, air squats, and sit-ups. And we just wanted to keep it military style easy. Right. Um, and then of course at the end, it's kind of like, all right, this, you know, you're doing the workout you close it out and you're like, all right, this is you like 15 straight pull-ups. Right. And you just kind of go on it. You know, you're tired and you're smoked and you do it. And we're joking around like one for the army, one for the core for the Korean Corps birthday. Yeah, yeah. You know, one for America. But um, it's very important to me. It's uh, it's sanity. It keeps me sane uh, to stay physically fit. Uh, specifically, when we talked, we mentioned COVID earlier. You know, in our conversation, right? Um, some of the coping mechanism that I have to stay mentally sane is is working out every day. Um, it's also an addiction, I, and, and that's, that's a bad thing, right? Because if I don't get a workout, then I feel like my day is just is ruined. Um, and so right now I'm thinking about my workout this afternoon, <laughs> So, but then, then my, then Kara will, is always like, but Flo, this is why your, your wound's not healing is because you're not giving it time to heal. And I, she's got a point, but I don't know. It's I'm my own worst enemy in essence. Sir, sometimes we have to just sit back. I know it was hard for me too. I had surgery on my hand and this, it was in January and uh, I still can't do a push up. So yesterday I was heading out coins and people want to do a push up. So I was on one hand. I was like, I can't really go down. I don't want to embarrass myself because they're taking pictures. So <laughs> I still want to get up there. I want to do a leg tuck. I want to do a push up. I want to do a burp. And it's hard. But we're our worst enemy sometimes because we just want to do so much. But we have limitations, sir. Yeah. You know, I have to get that time and heal flow. Look. <laughs> So I'm major. I'll tell you one thing though, and as this is true, and this is sad, but it's true. Um, you know, they say well, as you get older, right, your met- metabolism doesn't it doesn't operate the same way, and you start getting pounds here and there. And I'm like, man, I never get there. I was uh, listen after I received the medal, uh, we went on this tour, and I didn't work out. We, you know, we stayed up really late, and we had you know a lot of food, and we had drinks and stuff, and I got pudgy, and I've seen <laughs> I've seen pictures, and I was like, I mean, seriously, pictures. I told my wife, I was like, is that me? She's like, oh, yeah, that's you. Uh, <laughs> like, How did that happen? She's like, you didn't work out and you drank a lot and you ate a lot and you never slept. She's like, the re- pure recipe for your body to change. I'm like, but how do you change so fast? She's like, you're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly I'm like, oh, come on now. So now I'm in my head, I'm like, I might going to do my workout. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can do good workouts. Oh, man. Oh, man. So, sir, I'm going to switch back real quick. So you received the Medal of Honor on uh, 11 November uh, 2015 from President Barack Obama. During uh, his remarks, he said on his very worst day, he summoned and he managed to summon his very best. What What do you remember most about the ceremony on that day? Uh, I felt and I felt like I felt uh, there was one word to describe it. Shame. Um, I remember being on that stage and, and, you know, everyone's, there's so, there's so, so many, you know, in leaders, you know, secretary of defense, secretary of the armies, and, you know, and there was my team, uh, there was the boss now who's the J3 at the Pentagon, uh, 10 general Mingus, uh, there was my, the gold star families, which is super important for me and my family and my friends, and then all of these cameras. And you're standing on the stage with the president of the United States to your left, you know, talking about you, and you're singled out, and you're highlighted, and you call a hero for the worst day of your life. And I've never felt so uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, we all know that in the military, it's not ever about you, it's about the team. And so the fact that here I was being singled out and, and highlighted by myself while my team was to my left sitting down, I, uh, I felt incredible. I felt like a fraud. I have imposter syndrome. You feel like, you know, uh, I, I fooled the world and... I don't know what is wrong with these people. And, and so you feel shame. And then I felt mostly shame because we're talking about me when four of my friends are dead on, you know, on a mission that I led and, there, and three of those families are in front of me. And so that was, that was how I felt. It was incredibly uncomfortable, but president Obama was instrumental in, and in, in, on that day in, in terms of getting me back in, into the right mindset too. Right. 
um, he told me you know, in, in, in private that, hey, you, just because you receive this medal doesn't mean that your your mission's over. Like, this is just, you're a courier of it. Um, and I use the word courier now all, always. And you have a heck of, you have a platform to do an incredible amount of good. Uh, and I, I know you, I trust in you that you will be an, an outstanding representative of our nation and of this medal and what it represents. And um, that's something that I am. To this day, I am super grateful for him because he didn't have to say any of these things, right? He didn't have to spend that time that we spent. Um, and I've had opportunities to meet him prior. And it, get, it helped me also with the fact that the Gold Star families were, you know, were there. They were, we took a lot of pictures and they were so happy for me. And it gave me a, a better understanding at the end of that day. I took shame and I removed it from, and then I, I, I put a purpose behind it and a mission. And that is to go out there and, you know, be a positive force for my community, our veteran community, for our nation, um, and to never be part of the negativity that's out there. So, yeah, I, I did watch the ceremony, uh, sir, and you know, just just seeing you on stage, and when you say shame, you know, I was like, wow, that that's 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 deep, because I would never think that you would have said shame. You know, I saw the tears rolling down your face. I mean, I'm a star major, but sometimes I get a little bit, you know, them little tear jerkers get me. So when the little tear almost fell out my eye, I was like, get back in there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Too, I was the same thing. I was like, come on, what are you doing? <laughs> it didn't work, it didn't work, sir. No, but, um, you know, I, I saw that and and the word shame that you use, I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of deep. Why did you use that word? Because that's how I felt. Honestly, it's, um, it's, I felt like we should never be singled out. And I, I felt that, you know, Mahoney, you know, he received a silver star, you know, follow me right into the gates of hell. Uh, O-Chart followed exactly to the TD, my instructions prior. And there's a lot more to the story, right? Like I, t I, I switched position in a diamond on that day because I felt really uncomfortable. You know, you just get your spidey senses, senses that come up and you just know something's wrong. I've been in too many firefights in my life to not realize something was wrong, something was bad, that goes bad was gonna happen. So did my uh, Sergeant First Class Brink, Brian Brink, he knew it too. It, I just, we just knew something bad was gonna happen. So we try to mitigate all the, the threats right away. So we changed our positioning. Um, I was usually in the rear of the diamond uh, because I wanted the responsibility to take down the bosses in case something happened. And I went to the, uh, to the spirit of diamond because I wanted better, you know, visibility, which is the reason why I was the first one to the bomber. Cause I was closest to him. Um, and I told old chart who had just joined us, you know, PFC. And I said to him, um, listen, no matter what happens, if you see me move one direction, you grab the boss and you move him the opposite direction. Don't ask questions. Don't care what he says, just do it. And he did just that. Think about that. Like, as I moved towards the bomber, he grabbed the boss and moved into the right. And the boss only had a traumatic, you know, TBI, a concussion off that. The other brigade commander, unfortunately, um, and he's still in, um, and I think that was Lieutenant General Walrath, uh, he, you know, he spent four months with me at the hospital, you know, with similar injuries to his legs. Uh, and it's because we didn't have enough people to, like, bring, you know, to take care of all the principles, right? And and to me, everyone played a specific role. Uh, Brink cordoned on, cordoned on the whole area. He started treating my medic, saved my life, put a tourniquet on my leg, and, and you know, triage multiple other people. So everyone plays such an important role. And here I was by myself being highlighted, and everybody's calling me, like, you save all these people. And so you feel shame, right? You just kind of like, that's not true. That's not me. Like, I didn't I didn't do anything more special. And I don't want it to feel like I'm more special, too, because I'd rather trade all this and not be here and have my friends there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, you, Captain, you have chosen a life of service. What do you want today's men and women in uniform to know about choosing a, a life like you have? Well, I think it's, you know, to be proud of the uniform that they wear. And um, I would challenge them to, to, you know, go into open up a couple of history books and and read about the men and women who put on this uniform and the things they've done different, you know, not, and not just like go down, like all the way down to, you know, uh, to, to our independence, right. To go even go to the civil war, go, go, you know, talk about, you know, go to world war one, by the way, I used to, I used to quiz my, my soldiers. Uh, I'm like, what, what year did world war one start and then, 
and be like, whoa, so you get some crazy answers sometimes. You know, what do we fight? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so the reason why I asked him I, when I was in, I used to ask my soldiers to, you know, we used to do history classes is so that you find pride and honor in, in where and what the uniform represents, what those men and women, you know, sacrifice for us to be here today, what we represent. Um, and that was massive for me. Like I was, every time I put on uniform, I felt grateful. I felt privileged. Right. And, and I felt like I was being honored because I represented something that was so important for our nation and for, and for our world. And when we went out and deployed and we fought the enemy, um, I knew that we were part, becoming part of history. Uh, you know, maybe no one would know what we did on those days. You know, it doesn't matter, but we're still part of, of history and we need to be a, on the good side of history. That means we need to do our job the right way, right? And we need to go out there and be proud of, of each other. And so I want them to be proud of what they're doing. You know, that's my message. Be proud of what you represent. Um, and you are allowing me and my wife to go to bed like babies at night because we feel safe because of the men and women who put on the uniform and who are willing to put their lives on the line and sacrifice their family time, right? Their holidays, right? Their kids ball games so that her and I can live in this free world. We might disagree on a lot of things in this country, but that's the beauty of it is because men and women fight for us to be able to disagree and technically be civil about it. That's, we should be civil about everything, but you know, but that's the, that's what this country and, and it's truly, different from almost anywhere else in the world i know i grew up in france right so it's you know western europe and uh, it's different europe is different it really is and there's something special about this nation and sometimes that's why we're so the best and also that's why sometimes we appear to be you know dysfunctional uh mm -hmm. it's because it's that's part of the recipe we are allowed to be dysfunctional that's what that's what freedom is it's not that's what democracy is it's not always easy and pretty it's hard work it's the hardest work in the world Harder, I, being living in, under a dictator is easy, right? It's like they tell you exactly what to do and then they punish you. Here, we have an opportunity to be open and share and disagree and be angry at each other. But in the end, it's democracy. And so I want them to be proud of what they allow us to be in the country that we, we are. And um, I'm just thankful for them. Awesome, awesome. And uh, those are wonderful words uh, uh, to, to our uh, service members that wear the uniform. Uh, so uh, I, I got a quick story and I'm about to solidify your, your A1 listing uh, rock status right now. So when we pushed the promo out for, um, for, for this interview, uh, an old airman of mine, uh, Christine Gerber, she's, she's a, uh, a TAPS, she does something in the TAPS realm, right? The transition assistance realm. And she's like, oh my God, I teach this portion of TAPS. And, uh, you know, Captain Groberg is, is part of, our, our briefing. And so I was like, okay, man, send me the video. So I got a chance to look at the video uh, and, and see, and I'm thinking in my head, like, man, this, this guy just won the Medal of Honor. Like we should be transitioning him into like this, this cush of a life or whatever, and he shouldn't have any anxiety. But then, you know, that that's just me kind of thinking a little ignorantly. And then, but we, we talked about it earlier, me and uh, Sergeant Major, like this, this is, you know, for, for a lot of veterans that are transitioning from active duty to civilian life, that is a scary thing. Like it is a super, super scary thing. And so, um, uh, so it's, it was cool to see you on the video for one thing. Uh, and you're talking about the anxiety that uh, even a Medal of Honor winner has the same anxiety as, as anybody that gets out. And, and I'm sure you got out a little bit prematurely because I'm sure you weren't planning on getting out when you got out. So just that transition. Uh, so can you talk about the transition into civilian life and uh, kind of what are you up to now? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, uh, I did, I did leave the military a lot sooner than I expected. I, you know, I, I think like many, I, well, maybe not many, but I went in, wanted to do a career. My two, five, 10 year plans were all in the military. I did not have a contingency plan that, that spelled civilian at all. Uh, so when I did become a civilian, I was you know a little shocked to the system. But I'm a, I'm a lucky one because I was in the hospital system, so I had more time to actually identify my next steps. And so what I needed to do was really figure out like, all right, what what are, what are my passions, um, and how do I get there? And so to identify my passions, I started thinking about well, I need to find a mentor. Uh, and I need to find a mentor that understands where I'm coming from. So someone that sort of walked my walk and that successfully transitioned. And that was Jared Shepard, um, you know, former army sniper guy, 
and he had started his own businesses and he's incredibly successful to this day. And so him and I, you know, we connected, it took a little bit of time uh, for us to, for me actually to, to gain that trust. And we connected and then we did something really interesting in terms of uh, identifying my passion. We uh, took a piece of paper. And so this is for anyone that's thinking about transitioning. This is, this is really the simplest thing you can ever do. All right, saw a major, take a piece of paper and you break, you know, you, right. you, you put it, you cut it in half, right? Or, you know, you put a line and you, and you create in you know, two sides. And then on one side, you write, you know, five to 10 things that you absolutely love doing. Um, and then on the other side, you write five to 10 things you absolutely don't want to do. And so I did that. And my first thing that I wrote on, I didn't want to do was I didn't want to sit in front of a computer 10 hours a day in a cubicle. You know, in a cubicle. Um, so, you know, and that was really simple. And then you know, on the other side, I put, I want to travel. I want to be a, a mission oriented. I want to be, you know, connect with people. I still want to play a role and, you know, serve in my country if I can, if possible. And so I had all these listings here you know, on, the, on the good side and on the bad side. I only had a couple where I, I just don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. So those couple on the bad side eliminated like 80% of jobs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it was great because it gave me sort of a better a pathway towards, all right, let me go focus on this, this, and this. And in the end, I was able to, uh, you know, I would transition to one of the agencies, three letter agencies. Uh, I went and worked in, clande- in the clandestine world. Um, I was traveling, meeting with people, mission centric, still serving my nation. All those things that I put on my left side, I found those, right? But it wasn't an income easy. I had to network, build a network after that through my mentor uh, and go through, you know, educate myself. And then the last piece I did is, um, and I recommend this to anyone, right? Whether or not you're incredibly successful or not, I, I, I always knew I needed to further my education. So I took, um, I took uh, I, the GI Bill that I had and I went in to get my master's in the meantime. So while still working and while still recovering. Uh, this is why military, we multitask. We're good at doing this. Yeah. We're organized and we're disciplined. And so we can do multiple things. And I, and I went for it. This is all prize and medal. So I was out when I received the medal, right? I was mm-hmm. a civilian. Um, and then when I received the medal, unfortunately, what happened is that uh, you can't be a, you know, you can't be in a clandestine world and, and, work with and have a Wikipedia page. That's what I received. That's, that's the comment I got from uh, 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 General Stewart. Um, and so I, tra- I had to transition again and I had to go start through that whole process mm-hmm. again. It was frustrating. It was difficult. Um, I actually was really, really frustrating because I was really happy in my, my next career. And I had started again to go into corporate America. And I got lucky. I met a Marine, uh, Greg Call, who was running the veterans program for LinkedIn. And he, he, he had this idea of us working together, putting mm-hmm. a campaign to highlight, you know, veterans on his platform and all the different resources there are for, you know, to help service members transition successfully. And I was going through it. So I was living it uh, while, you know, being an advocate and spokesperson for it. So it was amazing. So I was literally the living proof of like, this is what this does. And then I started to understand LinkedIn. I'd be, I started writing on LinkedIn, became very active. And it changed my whole perspective. I built a massive network. It opened to so many doors. I learned so much through the Linda courses. Heck, I even did a Linda course later on for, on transitioning. So it's still there now with LinkedIn. Um, and you know, I'll give a plug to LinkedIn because I work for Microsoft and you know, they're part of our, our ecosystem. Uh, you, if, when you transition, you get LinkedIn you know, premium for free for a year, right? Uh, so that that so any individuals in the military that transition you get so sergeant major you get free LinkedIn premium and LinkedIn premium is great because it gives you a lot of those details that you need from people like hey this is where they're working this is you know all, all, you know city and and this is how you connect with them and cool stuff so I did all that um, but it's hard work I always I will tell I will tell this to anyone that wants to transition find a mentor build a network take that piece of paper breaking up in half and figure out things that you really truly want to focus on that you love right. And don't be afraid to put yourself out there. This is my last piece of advice. I was a grunt. I was an infantryman. My first tour in Afghanistan, I remember going on Facebook uh, one time. When we had three computers, and as an officer, I was always the last one on. So it was like one o'clock in the morning. I went on it, and I saw a couple of my friends working for you know these cool companies. And I remember thinking, one of them was working for actually Facebook. And I remember thinking, I'll never be working for Facebook. I was a criminal justice major in in college, uh, and I'm a grunt now. I'm an infantryman. I don't bring anything to the table. That's, that's, that's BS. I've worked with LinkedIn. I've then went into the aerospace business, right? I uh, with Boeing, an amazing company. And now I'm with Microsoft, a tech company. And I'm, I'm leading missions for, their, for an engineering team. My team consists of like technical mission architects, experts. 
I don't understand half the things they say to me, you know, <laughs> but I'm still, the, I'm still with them. I'm still leading. I'm still creating. And I'm still part, you know, that ecosystem. And it's challenging, but because of my experience in the military, being uncomfortable and comfortable, you know, being comfortable in very uncomfortable situations, uh, being at my best in some of the most high risk and austere type of environments and not being as scared for, for a challenge. I have been successful in these industries and I continue to be successful today. And lastly, I'm not afraid to fail because I know when I fail that I'm going to learn a very important lesson that's going to allow me to get back up, become stronger professionally, personally, and then go out there and drive on and accomplish a mission. Man, you are just dropping nuggets all over the place, man. That's so notes. Exactly. I'm, I'm trying to write stuff down and memorize stuff. Same. Okay. <laughs> I just, I, mean, tore, I, just, I just tore my I just tore my sticky in half and uh, <laughs> and then you go look at it. Why did I do that? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> he didn't say tear it in half. He said fold it in half. Oh, oh my bad, my bad. Split it, fold it. Yeah. Sir, I wanted to pause here for a moment to share some of the feedback you've been receiving from our viewers on our live feed. I'm gonna be looking at my phone here, scrolling through some of the comments. Jasmine Dede says, imposter syndrome is real, but you represented your team, hashtag purpose. Um, we do have people watching from all over the world. We have, um, Blake Richardson is asking, he wants to know what is your motivator? What gets you up and going? I think my, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I'm, I challenge myself to, so I, here's the thing, here's the truth about me. I, uh, I'm, I, I live with, I have a lot of fear, right? Everything that I do, I feel like I don't belong or I'm going to mess it up and screw it up. Right. And I think that's fear and I turn in into, you know, it's energy. And so uh, same thing when I was in combat. Right. I mean, I think, you know, I had a lot of fear, but you don't show the fear, right? You, uh, the fear keeps you alive in essence. It, it actually kicks complacency out uh, because it makes you aware of the risk and the opportunities. And it tell, it remind, to me, it reminds me of like, oh, okay, you need to be at your best right now. So every single day, my motivator is to make sure that I earn my spot on the team, on this earth, uh, you know, my wife, my family, right? I mean, heck, I, I, I married up, let's be honest, right? I married up. So like, it's, you know, I got, and I'm not, I'm not always like, I have my faults. I have my weaknesses, right? Uh, uh, I got my frustration and she's always been by my side, you know, pick me up when, when, you know, during the dark times. And so I need to be the best husband possible. I need to go out there and be the best leader and teammate in my organization. Right. That means I need to put a little bit extra time at night. You know, when she goes to sleep, I'll be writing email at 10, 11 PM or trying to read things because I need to further my education, my own business. So that I can be the right effective leader when I wake up at 6 AM in the morning to go to my first meeting. Um, and then I need to be, I, I, I think I'm always challenged myself with, uh, you know, again, the imposter syndrome, I know people are like, like, yeah, I get it. I appreciate those comments, but to me, it's okay to have that in my head because it challenges me to be a bet, to go out there and make sure I earn it. Uh, and that there's never going to be the word enough, right? You've done enough. I think there's always an opportunity for us to do a little bit more. And I do believe I'll be one of those individuals that's working until like he's 80, 85 years old, right? When everybody's like, I really can't stand flow because he's he can't even walk straight and he's, <laughs> uh, or like he wants to be a part of this. But that's because I was I was I was designed that way, um, and because you, I, I want to be part of something greater than myself always, and I want to I want to support those around me. So I, I, that's my motivation. And lastly, people died for me, uh, and so they're no longer here, and I need to earn that. Um, absolutely, absolutely. So. Um, so we had uh, Colonel uh, Jack Jacobs on uh, last week, and uh, he's, he's he's a funny guy, funny guy. And so he, he told us a story about um, he, he was sitting on one of the Medal of Honor uh, dinners or, or some type of social event, and uh, General Doolittle comes over and, and, and puts his arm around him. He's, he's a young he's a young guy. He's like, you're a Medal of Honor with it. Don't screw this up or, or something something to that effect like it was it was something have you got any because i'm sure there are a lively bunch uh the the, the living uh, medal of honor winners uh if somebody came in and gave you like a, a knuckle sandwich or something uh as you as you kind of initiate you into this this fraternity I, yeah i i don't even know where to start with that one <laughs> yeah you get you get a lot um it's been really more i mean do little do you imagine like that's crazy. yeah, yeah. Like, that is crazy uh, I, I got more of the, they're incredibly respectful, 
um, the older generation. And so they've, they've really embraced us and, and they want us to be involved. That's their biggest thing. Um, you know, they're thinking legacy at this, at this, at a lot of their stages in their lives. I'm not. Um, and actually, to be honest with you, I never want to think legacy. Um, I, when I'm, when I, when it's all said and done, I want, I want to be remembered as a good husband, a good father, a good businessman, someone that took care of his community and someone that served his country honorably in the time of war. Right. And they want to add medal of honor in there and they can add medal of honor, but that's just not who I am. Um, but when they think about legacy, those guys, though, they fought in Vietnam, they fought in Korea, they fought in World War II, you know? I mean, think about that, right? Korea and Vietnam. They, especially the Vietnam guys, Korea and Vietnam guys, right? They didn't get the love that we received. Uh, exactly. They struggled for a long time. So their legacy is, I want to recognize a man that died by my side. No one that committed and their lives were affected uh, for, the, you know, for decades after. No one really, truly cared. So that's their legacy, right? They're they're representing their brothers, and so I'm 100% in to support them with that. I love the way they think. Um, I have so much to learn from them. I mean, they're they're brilliant, but they're also people. Uh, they say dumb things too. Uh, let's be honest, right? Do we, <laughs> just because we have this, right? Often, you know, just because we have this medal, right? And this is the second one, by the way. My my first my the medal I received from President Obama. Uh, was uh, is back at my unit at Fort, uh, Fort Carson, where it belongs with the oh, unit. Awesome. Same with Clint Romache's, and we follow Sal Junta's uh, path because uh, he was the first one to do it. But it's like we're people, right? Just because you're 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 a courier of the metal doesn't mean you can predict the weather tomorrow. You're a geopolitical expert on policies now, and that you know you're such a matter of historical, such a matter of expert on military history and things like that. We're normal people, so we have our faults, we have our weaknesses, like I mentioned earlier, um, and we're highlighted for an action that happened in an event. Uh, and so we all, you know, need to make sure that we're reminded of, of that. And I, that's what I, that's a lesson that I learned from the older generation. Like walk the path the right way. Absolutely. And, you know, Jack Jacobs is an excellent example of that. I love that man. He's hilarious too. Yeah, yes, he is. Funny. Yeah, because he was like, I could have did this. He had a meeting that he had to go to or um, he's like, I I'm sad we kind of cut this short because man, I had a bunch of stories for it. We just started going through some stuff. So it was, it was a good interview, definitely. Well, I, I, I agree. I have a meeting too to go to and, but I'm like, you know, Karina, she's with the lawyers. I, I, I'm trying to ask her for my work and when I tell her, hey, this is what I'm doing, she'll be like, why did you even like leave that meeting? So, yeah, awesome, awesome. <laughs> like, so, uh, well, I don't know, well, go ahead. Sir, we, we gonna cut it short then so you can get to your meeting. So before, sir, before we say goodbye to you, do you, or are you ready to leave us? No, no. Julie has something? I see Julie's hand. No, no, that was, I was adjusting my light, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it fell. <laughs> got you in school. I got a question. <laughs> No, sir. So before we say goodbye to you, do you have any parting words for our viewers? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I this is going to be different than maybe some others. I think we have an unbelievable opportunity today to be part of the he healing process in our nation. I will say this to, be, to, to everyone here. Here's the coolest thing I learned in the military. I was part of a group of individuals. I was part of a team. I had white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Christian, Muslim, Jews, atheists, straight, gay, individuals that were willing to die for each other. We had master's degree folks. We had GED folks. We had people from Compton to Boston, Massachusetts. We had people that didn't really speak English, that were immigrant, right? or you know that were from Mexico, wherever you want to come from. All together, we all wore the same uniform and we all were willing to die for each other. We all became best friends. We all disagreed, but we put our differences aside and we came to learn to how to love each other and respect each other. I've never, there was, there's no other organization in the world that works with diversity the way the military does. It's forced upon you early on but in the end, it's accepted widely by everyone. And if we can do that in those settings, if we can put our lives on the line for each other and, and put in all those months and years working with each other and then become best friends outside when we transition, we are part of this healing. We could be part of this healing process for our nation. 
I am a firm believer that all it takes to remove this division is the ability to be able to listen to each other with respect before injecting our own opinions. And if we can start doing that and based off our experiences in the military, we can be part of, our, of the healing in our community. So that's a responsibility that I sent to everyone. Uh, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, I don't care what you are, Libertarian, Green Party, but I take that aside. Let's just be civil to each other and let's honor the fact that a lot of our friends have put their lives on the line so that we can be free and have the right opinion, our own opinions. But let's, let's be part of the solution. Um, we've done it across the world for a thousands of miles. We can, we sure as heck can do it home too. So at home as well. That's my word of advice. And you might not agree with it, but guess what? Welcome to America. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> America man. the beautiful. Listen, oh. we, we can drop the microphone on that, though, that piece of advice, man. I'm talking about sex with chocolate, all that stuff, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Cam Groger, Groberg, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and sharing your life of service, sharing your story, man. You have a, a wonderful story, and I'm glad that you're paying it forward. Uh, you know, on behalf of the the, the men that you you lost that day, uh, but you're continuing, they're, they're, they're putting their name in the forefront, and you're doing stuff that every American should be doing. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, this chat meant so much for the airmen, the soldiers, that the Marines, the Space Force, sa sailors, Coast Guard members. Man, we got. We, we got a lot of folks defending this country. And so that, that's awesome. And uh, we appreciate everything you've done for this great nation. I, that means the world to me. Thank you. Uh, Y'all have a heck of a great show. I am super impressed by all the folks that you bring you bring on. Tell the rock that I say, what's up? Uh, <laughs> my, my world now, so it's cool. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, um, you know, it's uh, it's a pleasure and, you know, it, it, um, I would lo always love the opportunity to come back. So if you, you know, if this is something that y'all want a couple years down the road, you think uh, I'd be a good guest, it'd be fun to come back because I'd really enjoy this conversation. Awesome. You are welcome anytime with us. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And so many blessings to you, sir. And uh, we're going to end the chat. Uh, if you could stay on uh, for just a little bit longer, I got to get some information from you. Sounds good. Thanks for having us, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> She's a